I'd like to thank the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, the topic of thrombotic microangiopathies in pregnancy. The title of my talk is, Is it HELP Syndrome? Is it TTP? Is it Atypical HUS? Does it matter? And I'm hoping by the end of this talk, you will recognize that the diagnosis does matter. So this is a brief outline of my uh, discussion today. So I will start off with a case description of a young lady that we saw in the hospital. I will then re review the thrombotic microangiopathies, give you an overview um, as to the, the pathogenesis of the syndromes. And then I will go into each of the individual clinical syndromes and describe briefly the management of these syndromes and sp specific therapy um, for, for some of them. And then conclude by talking about briefly how one can distinguish the thrombotic microangiopathies from one another and, and the two mimics that often present in pregnancy, preeclampsia and acute fatty liver of, the pregnant, of pregnancy. So my case is a, a young lady that we saw in the hospital about a year and a half ago. She was a 28-year-old female with a past medical history of hepatitis C, asthma, marijuana, and tobacco use. She presented three days after an uncomplicated vaginal delivery at full term and underwent tubal ligation. The tubal ligation and the delivery were uncomplicated, and, but um, she presented a few days later with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. She was seen in the ED. She was noted to have a tender abdomen and a low-grade temperature of 100.2. And a CBC drawn at the time showed a mild anemia, a hemoglobin of 9.9, .9, normal platelet counts, and a mildly dirty urine. Based on these findings, um, and, and a CT abdomen that was unremarkable, she was diagnosed with a, a UTI, given ceftriaxone, and discharged to home on ciprofloxacin. Her symptoms, however, worsened, and she presented five days later. Now we're eight days from delivery with daily diarrhea and worsening of her abdominal symptoms. She did not have any bleeding or bruising or neurologic symptoms on representation, but her hemoglobin was 6.3, and her platelet counts were um, low at 62. She now had acute renal insufficiency with a BUN of 52 and a creatinine of 4.3. Over the next few days, she was, she was obviously hospitalized at this time, and over the next few days, her renal function deteriorated, and she was started on hemodialysis. When we were consulted, this was her blood film, and as you can see, there's evidence of microangiopathy with schistocytes, as noted here by the green arrows. There was also thrombocytopenia, lack of, of low platelets, an occasional giant platelet as shown here and a an, um, nucleated red cell indicating significant hematopoietic stress and uh, uh, reticulocytosis. So when we uh, saw her, we were confronted with the question, is this HELP, is this TTP, or this, is this atypical HUS? So the, the reason I selected this case was that it is really uh, a diagnostic dilemma in pregnancy as well as the postpartum setting. And as, as, you, as uh, I will get into, a number of thrombotic microangiopathies are in the differential. Um, and clearly this was pregnancy associated because of, of its proximity to her delivery. And, and really what, what this highlights is the uh, potential for rapid deterioration with these clinical syndromes and the potential for poor outcomes. And in this case, even though she delivered a healthy, preg uh, a healthy baby, um, the, the mother was at significant risk for end-stage renal disease. And, um, and, and, and often in pregnancy, delivery is an option for thrombotic microangiopathies, but in the postpartum setting, um, delivery is no longer uh, at, at issue, and, and we really have to come up with the right diagnosis, and therefore we need a plan B. And this is where an understanding of the, the pathophysiology of the syndromes is really critical to, to the management. So what are thrombotic migraineopathies? Um, they are uh, basically a, what I consider a destination and not the origin. So the thrombotic migraineopathies as shown here at the middle of the, the spoke are really the end result of a number of disease um, etiologies as shown here. Um, the, the one that we most often think of in hematology is idiopathic or immune TTP caused by autoantibodies to ADMTS13. But the mimics 
um, of uh, of TTP are, are several, including health, as we will get to, congenital TTP, not the acquired kind. Drugs can also cause uh, thrombotic microangiopathy, as can autoimmune uh, diseases such as lupus and other connective tissue diseases, cancer, DIC, bone marrow transplantation, and atypical HUS. These are all various um, diagnoses the end result of which um, is a thrombotic microangiopathy. And what is that exactly? A thrombotic microangiopathy um, includes a manifestation of hemolysis, microangiopathic hemolysis, as defined by red cell fragmentation or schistocytes occurring at greater than 1%, and that um, greater than 1% is one out of 100 red cells. Um, more commonly, we use about 5 to 10, um, just as a... As a um, a rough starting point for assessing significant hemolysis, intravascular hemolysis, um, and evidence of tissue ischemia that's caused by um, thrombosis in the microvasculature, including evidence of an elevated LDH um, and uh, reticulocyte count caused by fragmentation of the red cells and decreased haptoglobin. And then accompanying the red cell fragmentation is a thrombocytopenia due to consumption um, or incorporation of platelets into uh, the thrombi. And then most importantly, um, there is no other etiology for mechanical hemolysis because red cells can be fragmented by uh, valvular disease. And so we have to make sure that there is no other cause of intravascular hemolysis. In terms of the, the pathogenesis of these syndromes, they can be uh, cause the intravascular hemolysis and red cell shearing as shown here is depicted with the red cell being caught up in, in uh, a fibrin sheath. Um, the, the, the pathogenesis differs whether it's TTP or non-TTP. So for immune or congenital TTP, um, the, the red cell fragmentation is caused by accumulation of platelet aggregates in the vasculature. Um, um, by long strands of von Willebrand factor that basically resemble these fibrin, um, uh, fibrin strands shown here. And they trap um, not only the red cells, but platelets. Um, and then when they trap the red cells, they shear it like shown here. And then they, the platelets accumulate um, due to the adhesiveness of the von Willebrand factor for the platelets. In non-TTP syndromes, it's caused by endothelial cell injury. And so this results in um, endothelial swelling as shown here by this arrow. This is the endothelium. Normally it's much, um, the, the, the membranes are much closer. So there's endothelial swelling. And then um, this leads to endothelial activation and uh, accumulation of platelets and microvascular um, thrombosis resulting in the same um, problem of red cell So now getting into the individual syndromes, um, the first we will talk about is health. That's hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme, and liver. It was first defined in 1982 based on the constellation of these laboratory findings. Its incidence is anywhere from 0.2 to 0.9% of all pregnancies. And whether the pathogenesis of this syndrome is its, its own distinct entity or if, or if it's a severe variant of preeclampsia is, is controversial at this time. Um, and the reason why it's controversial is that about 15 to 20 percent of patients present without antecedent hypertension or proteinuria, which is characteristic of preeclampsia. And unlike preeclampsia, patients with health often present uh, or are multiparous rather than from a gravida. The maternal mortality associated with this syndrome is still fairly high, three to four percent. The fetal mortality is higher because oftentimes um, the fetus is distressed for far longer than before the mother presents and or because of prematurity, um, because um, the presentation often necessitates delivery. And the majority of patients uh, with health present preterm with the remainder occurring 48 hours after delivery. The symptoms are often nonspecific, uh, including upper abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, malaise, or headache. Um, and other than uh, laboratory features, there are no other di uh, diagnostic features, um, such as a biomarker. 
and uh, the prolonged thrombocytopenia and persistent elevation in LDH can be seen for weeks after postpartum, even with delivery and resolution of some of the clinical manifestations. What we do understand about the pathogenesis of health is that there is systemic endothelial dysfunction. Um, there is evidence of abnormal placentation and release of vasoactive substances into the circulation. Intravascular fibrin deposits in the liver can be seen, and that leads to hepatic sinusoidal obstruction and intrahepatic vascular congestion. And what has led to the controversy in the pathogenesis of this syndrome is that in some cases, complement um, that this disorder is uh, associated with significant complement activation. And it's thought to possibly be a variant of atypical HUS in these cases. Um, and um, this has been um, really shown in the last decade or so, where there's been um, studies to show abnormal complement activation products in the plasma of patients with health. There's also increased deposition of complement on endothelial cells when plasma from patients with health is um, uh, incubated with these endothelial cells. And um, these are studies from the John Hopkins group led by Dr. Brodsky and uh, a very talented young junior faculty, um, Jason Vaught, uh, where they demonstrated that patients, uh, the plasma of patients with either congenital or acquired health um, have evidence of, uh, of increased complement activity that leads to um, lysis um, in this assay. And so the, the complement mediated lytic activity is present in, in patients with congenital and acquired health, maybe a little bit in preeclampsia, but certainly not in healthy pregnancy. And, uh, and to, to buttress these findings, this group has also shown evidence of germline mutation in, uh, in the alternative pathway genes in about half of patients uh, with the HELP syndrome. So now um, they are conducting studies to investigate complement inhibition in, in patients uh, with HELP. The management of this syndrome continues to be supportive care um, with early delivery of pregnancy uh, of the baby if feasible. So fetal monitoring, treatment with magnesium sulfate as we do in preeclampsia, pharmacologic management of hypertension, if there is uh, hypertension that's accompanying this disease, and, um, and steroids um, to increase lung maturity. The treatment of choice currently is still delivery, although the role of ecolizumab in the management of this syndrome is being investigated, as I mentioned earlier. Certainly in, in several postpartum cases, um, this has been shown to be successful. There's only uh, one description of, of its use uh, in the antepartum setting, and this is in a 34-year-old mulliferous woman who presented with classic manifestation of health as uh, evidenced by elevated liver function tests, thrombocytopenia, haptoglobin, and this patient was treated with three doses of aculizumab, and the pregnancy was prolonged by 17 days in this individual. Um, and, um, but it, um, the delivery still happened fairly early at 29 weeks gestation. Uh, however, this allowed for the NAMI to be a, a heavier uh, at time of delivery. Now moving on to uh, uh, the closely related atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. So um, there are two types of um, hemolytic uremic syndrome that are uh, written about in the literature. One is a diarrheal HUS that's caused by sugar toxin producing E. coli, where there's a clear uh, you know, etiology and link with, the, with bacterial infection. But the one that we will be talking about today is the non-diarrheal variant of hemolytic uremic syndrome. It was first recognized in the 1970s, and its incidence is about two per million. It primarily affects children and young adults, um, and that's about 5 to 10 percent of hemolytic uremic cases, and the remainder are in adults um, in a sporadic form. What we do know is that pregnancy is a strong trigger, as 10 to 20 percent of patients with atypical HUS first present with the syndrome during pregnancy. And the clinical manifestation is really characterized by a predominant finding of acute renal insufficiency or acute renal failure, 
that is uh, accompanied by thrombocytopenia and microangiopathy. The epidemiology of atypical HUS is that it is related, it's strongly linked to complement dysregulation, which can be found in about 40%, 40 to 50% of sporadic cases, and in uh, the overwhelming majority of familial patient cases. What you have to understand is where there are genetic mutations in complement proteins or complement regulatory proteins, um, there is evidence of incomplete penetrance, meaning that this is not a constitutively active congen congenital disease, um, but, it, but it requires a second hit or a triggering event. And the majority of those with mutations in complement protein uh, present in the setting of a triggering event, such as diarrhea, respiratory illness, medications, or pregnancies. Of those with comp uh, genetic mutations, complement factor H mutations are the most common, and they're present in 20 to 25% of patients with atypical HUS, with CD46 mutations being the next most common and occurring in 10 to 13%. Um, Typically, patients with CD46 mutations or mutations of, um, of a membrane cofactor protein um, are, have a disease that runs a mild or So why is pregnancy a trigger for this disease? Uh, what we know, uh, as elegantly described by Gupta et al., we know that pregnancy is a complement amplifying condition. There's evidence of marked upregulation of complement activity in a healthy pregnancy. And we know uh, mutations of any of these complement regulatory proteins, which are highly expressed on the trophoblasts, if there are any mutations there, these are associated with uh, fetal demise in, in animals. We also have this data from a recent published uh, systematic review of pregnancy-associated atypical HUS, and that's from 60 cases. We know that the majority of patients who present with their atypical HUS occur in the postpartum setting. And um, diagnosis is often uh, accompanied by preeclampsia, obstetric hemorrhage, or fetal death. Uh, in the pre eculizumab era, maternal outcomes were um, uh, much worse. It went to deaths and uh, significantly uh, higher incidence of end-stage renal disease. Interestingly, fetal outcomes have not been affected by the eculizumab era, and that's possibly because a lot of cases present postpartum. The diagnosis of atypical HUS, as I alluded to um, earlier, is um, linked uh, to predominant renal manifestations of this syndrome. And uh, oftentimes, this renal disease is accompanied by vascular permeability complications, leading to cerebral, cerebral or pulmonary edema, pleural and pericardial effusions, ascites, or even brittle hypertension. So, um, this disease um, can, and can present fulminantly uh, with systemic signs. The diagnosis is one of, uh, of exclusion, making sure that this is not TTP, uh, uh, with findings of ADMTS13, which I'll get to in a minute. If um, there's evidence of complement dysregulation by depressed levels of C3 and C4, that's great, but oftentimes you don't see this. And um, ancillary studies, including complement uh, factor H and factor I autoantibodies or factor levels or um, genetic settings, uh, oftentimes the results of these are not available in real time and therapy must be instituted um, just based on uh, clinical decision making. So what is the therapy for atypical HUS? Um, this is um, a directed therapy by, of, of um, of a monoclonal antibody that directed to complement uh, 5 protein. And this is uh, the C5 protein is part of the terminal complement pathway. And um, the C5, uh, ecolizumab, which is the monoclonal antibody, was approved in 2011. And it is the treatment of choice uh, of patients who present with the clinical manifestations of TMA, renal dysfunction, and normal ADMTS13. You do not have to have evidence of complement dysregulation and to initiate therapy. And, um, and, and oftentimes for patients who present with renal dysfunction or, or on end stage uh, or on dialysis for end stage renal disease, 
you should um, initiate treatment as soon as possible because if it's early enough into the renal manifestations, you can often res uh, reverse um, the outcomes of end-stage renal disease. Is it safe in pregnancy? We think so. There's um, ecolizumab has been used extensively in the PNH population, and we do have um, data from, from PNH suggesting that this is safe for mothers and babies. And it's also, um, you should know that ecolizumab is en engineered to have reduced affinity for the neonatal FC receptor, which transports IgG across the placenta. And it's detected at low levels, but does not appear to affect the complement system of the newborn as uh, shown by Halstenson et al. And uh, postpartum, and there was a recent study that's showing in patients treated with atypical HUS um, who, who were uh, diagnosed in the postpartum period, it appears to be highly effective. And for those patients who were on dialysis at the time of drug initiation, all were able to come off of dialysis. So all the more reason to initiate, to think about uh, atypical HS early on and to initiate treatment. Thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura is the other TMA that occurs in pregnancy. Um, its incidence, especially the one that's, that we recognize is associated with severe item TS13, which is really uh, moving to uh, really uh, an essential element for diagnosis is about the same as atypical HUS, two per million. Peak age is ages 40 to 49 with a female predominance and a higher occurrence rate in African Americans uh, with a disproportionate presentation in those with uh, uh, severe Adam TS13 deficiency. The pathogenesis of TTP is clearly linked to um, dysregulation and uh, abnormal and deficiency of Adam TS13, either through uh, congenital deficiency or antibodies to, um, to this protein. This protein is a, its function, its only known function is to cleave ultra large von Willebrand uh, factor multimers as shown here um, in, in, as these strings with these red dots, the normal function of von Willebrand factor, um, especially large multimers, is under high shear stress, is to immobilize uh, platelets and um, to promote platelet clumping and platelet aggregation. Um, and normal in normal health, we have this von Willebrand factor cleaving protease or Adam TS13 that cleaves these ultra large multimers into smaller fragments so that they're no longer able to uh, support platelet clumping or platelet activation under high shear. But if you have an absence of this protein, these uh, von Willebrand factor multimers um, are, um, are hemostatically active and, and they will uh, cause clumping. So, the question becomes, why is pregnancy a preferred disease state for this disease? Uh, we, we know that 5 to 10 percent of all TTP cases occur in pregnancy, mostly in the third trimester postpartum, but a few can occur uh, in the first uh, trimester as well. And that's because it's linked to the VWF factor 8 axis um, during pregnancy. These uh, factor 8 and VWF levels increase in parallel for the first half of pregnancy to uh, support kind of the, the hemostatic challenge of, of, of uh, sustaining a pregnant, uh, the, the fetus. And VWF increases um, disproportionately more so than factor eight in the remainder of the pregnancy in the second half of pregnancy. And accompanying this increase in VWF is a, 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 an accompanying decline in Adam TS13 levels. And remember the Adam TS13 protein keeps the VWF in check, and so this level is going down in second and third trimester, and so um, the VWF Adam TS13 ratio is markedly higher in the second, third trimester and, per, uh, and persists through six weeks in the postpartum setting. And for this reason, it makes sense that in, in the congenital TTP, where there is a congenital uh, deficiency or mutations in the Adam TS13 protein, that um, this is uh, where this um, um, disease often presents um, in, in, in one TTP registry. 66% of female cases 
presented with TTP um, as our first manifestation of congenital ADMTS13 deficiency. And of course, um, this abnormality uh, um, of VWF ADMTS13 also um, makes it um, uh, an easy target for autoimmune TTP presentation. ADMTS13 is uh, the low levels of ADMTS13 and high ADMTS13 antibody levels are um, associated with high rates of mortality. And this is from a, a TTP registry um, that looked at 312 episodes. Mortality was increased in those um, not only with abnormalities in Adam TS13 levels, but who had evidence of high troponin indicating underlying effects on heart, heart function. And uh, those with severe neurologic disease also had higher mortality um, um, when, when they presented with these manifestations. Um, as shown here, if you have high Adam TS13 antibody levels, as shown on the x axis, and low Adam TS13 antigen levels, as shown on the y axis, so if you're in this quadrant, you had a significantly higher mortality rate um, than those who had uh, higher antigen levels and lower antibody levels. So um, the Adam TS13 level and antibody level um, can also be used as a marker uh, for higher um, uh, risk disease. The, the reason to know about Adam TS13 levels um, as a biomarker is that we, we have um, directed treatment uh, for this disease, which is caplasuzumab. Now, this antibody does not treat Adam TS13 directly, but affects um, disease by interfering with the pathology of thrombosis. So remember, the outcomes of this disease are associated with microvascular thrombosis. So where this drug, caplasuzumab, uh, interferes with, um, with disease activity is by interfering the von Willebrand factor platelet interaction, so it binds um, to the VWF site where, where platelets um, bind to the VWF, and so it prevents this interaction. And um, the phase three trial of this, of this drug, caplasuzumab, showed that patients who are treated with this drug have faster resolution of thrombocytopenia and, um, uh, and a significant reduction in death, recurrence, and thromboembolic events. So totally a game changer for the management of TTP. Where the problem is with this drug is that it's very expensive. It costs $7,700 uh, per dose, and the recommended treatment course is for 30 days. And so uh, one uh, treatment course is about $270,000. And a recent uh, published article in, um, um, sorry, I forgot to include the reference here, uh, it, that just came out um, in uh, 2021, is that when you look at the cost effectiveness of this drug for all comers of TTP, um, it's very expensive compared to standard therapy of plasma exchange and rituximab alone. And what you have to remember is that this does not interfere, uh, this drug interferes with thrombosis manifestations, but not the underlying pathology of getting rid of the ADMTS13 antibody. So you still have to use rituximab. So that's, that's where, um, you know, this really doesn't uh, impact long-term uh, management because you still have to get rid of the ADMTS13 antibodies. But I think where this, um, where studies will eventually um, show a role for this agent is in those with highly morbid disease, those with uh, very high ADMTS13 levels, or those who present with neurologic outcomes. Those are the individuals where early treatment with this drug may make a, a huge difference in, in clinical outcome and may make it more cost effective. So getting back to um, the question, is this help, TTP, atypical HUS, or does it matter? So this is summarizing all um, the, the three conditions we just discussed, help, TTP, and atypical HUS, um, and distinguishing these syndromes from the more common manifestations of preeclampsia and rare occurrence of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. And as shown here, what you have to think about is how each of these um, diseases present and what is um, the easiest one to rule in and rule out. Um, 
And so the first and foremost condition that's easiest to rule out because we have a, a diagnostic marker is TTP. So it's really easy to rule out if you get an Adam TS13. So I would recommend starting off getting an Adam TS13 um, level if you have any evidence of thrombotic microangiopathy and ruling it out. If you rule it in, then the treatment is very simple. You give plasma exchange, rituximab, uh, depending on where the patient is in pregnancy, and or caplosuzumab. The next one that is easy to rule out is atypical HUS because it comes also with an effective directed therapy that's an anti-C5 therapy. And so the, the, uh, the next most, um, as I said, the reason this is easy to rule out is because the renal um, manifestations are prominent. So if there is any amount of renal disease or a prog rapid progression of renal disease, then I would consider this diagnosis and um, um, think about initiating um, ecoluzumab. Then it becomes a matter of distinguishing preeclampsia from health and acute fatty liver. And then, you know, this is where looking at prominent manifestations of hypertension, which are usually characteristic of preeclampsia and neurologic symptoms, um, um, becomes important. And the management of these two are similar in a sense of using magnesium, management of hypertension, and delivery. And then acute fatty liver um, becomes um, also um, relatively easy to distinguish because of the, the striking liver manifestation and rapid deterioration associated with this disease. So um, I would kind of um, do it in that kind of an algorithm of TTP first, rule out atypical HUS, and then try and tease out whether preeclampsia help or AFLP is at play. So how about um, subsequent pregnancies? In, in patients with TMAs, we really don't know the answer. It's disease dependent and also availability of disease biomarkers. I think TTP is the one disease where we do have an effective biomarker and that's ADAMTS13 um, that can help us, um, especially for congenital management that becomes relatively straightforward because you can uh, offer plasma exchange monitored to the Adam TS13 levels. Acquired TTP is a little more tricky because it's hard to predict the behavior of the antibody, even if you're offering um, plasma exchange on a regular basis. And so um, I think that has to be uh, individualized for the patient and, um, and, and really insistent on, on um, and, and the availability of a multidisciplinary team to manage the patient. For atypical HUS, once again, it's easy. If the patient has a congenital mutation, it's already on ecoluzumab, then it's uh, easier to manage the patient to just continue um, and monitor um, the effectiveness of therapy. But for women who are not on therapy, um, who you want to present um, the occurrence of atypical HUS, I think this is uncharted territory, as is health. It's also uncharted because um, the recurrent health incidence is reported to be low although I, I suspect it's much higher in those with patient, those patients who may have uh, genetic um, complement mutations. So if you do have a diagnosis of a patient with first-time help, I would get um, a, a complement mutation screen, much, much like you get for atypical HUS, uh, to make sure that you don't have a, a, a complementopathy on your hands. And in those patients, um, then once again, a multidisciplinary team approach would be what I would recommend. Returning to our case, this patient had a diagnosis of atypical HUS. A characteristic of that case series, she presented in the postpartum period with prominent uh, renal manifestations. Uh, uh, we sent out uh, a genetic panel on her. Mutations were not identified. She did not have Adam TS13, so we initiated ecoluzumab. Um, she had rapid resolution of her hematologic abnormality. She recovered her renal function. And now we are at the point of trying to decide if we can stop aculizumab. And, and data is coming out that, um, that in certain cases, patients, particularly um, uh, patients who have an identifying trigger, that you may be able to stop aculizumab and uh, monitor them uh, long term.
also in the summary and conclusion, um, I hope I highlighted that pregnancy is a unique setting that is a trigger for thrombotic microangiopathies, often due to the hypercoagulable changes that accompany pregnancies, as well as uh, changes in the innate immune response um, that occur as a normal um, response to the fetus and, and uh, an adaptation of the vasculature to placentation. We also know that the thrombotic microangiopathies in pregnancies are associated with significant morbidity and that outcomes are often dictated um, by early diagnosis and aggressive intervention. And I think this is where it really highlights the progress we have made understanding the pathophysiology of thrombotic microangiopathies has um, had a dramatic uh, impact on diagnosis and and our ability to intervene early. And by intervening early, we're certainly impacting maternal outcomes. And the hope is that um, these will eventually translate to fetal outcomes as well. So, um, so thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions.